Hello everyone and welcome to the SJD Show where I talk about anything and everything I find interesting, usually from my trifecta of Formula 1, Eurovision and Doctor Who. Today we'll be looking at the second semi-final of Eurovision 2024, but first, the news! Uh, we'll start with Formula 1 then. Uh, constant rumours of Ricardo being ousted from Tor uh, RB. I mean, fine. Total Wolf saying that he might not stay at Mercedes. It's kind of it. Eurovision news then. So this is where, for once in this podcast, I think we've been doing this for about two, three months now, and for the first time, we have major Eurovision and Doctor Who news. So we have the official running order for both semi-final one and semi-final two. So the running order for semi-final one then. Cyprus will be opening with Liar, and then it will be Serbia with Ramonda. Then Lithuania with Looktail, then Ireland with Doomsday Blue. After Ireland, we will have our first member of the Big Five, which is the United Kingdom, with Dizzy. So as an opening opening five, I think I did say I didn't really know where you put Ireland. Putting it between two pretty good pop songs, probably the best place you can put it. Opening with Liar is interesting. I, 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 I still maintain that Croatia would have been a stronger opening, but hey-ho. Uh, then we have Ukraine with Teresa and Maria. Then we have Poland with the Tower. Then Croatia with the Rim Team Tagidim. Then Iceland with Scared of Heights. And then our second member of the Big Five, Germany, with Always on the Run. Uh, I mean, <clears throat> so, so far, I mean, Cyprus is fine. Lithuania, Ireland, UK, Ukraine. That's a very, very strong run. And then, you know, Poland, fine. Croatia, amazing. Iceland, fine. Germany, amazing. Then we have Slovenia, Finland with no rules, Moldova within the middle, Sweden with Unforgettable as our final member, the automatic qualifiers, Azerbaijan, uh, Australia, Portugal and Luxembourg. I think, I think the first half is a lot stronger than the second half. Um, typically there is one semi-final that is a lot stronger than the others and this year I think they're pretty evenly matched. So semi-final two then. Opening with Malta with Loop. Uh, what so for the main part of the podcast today, my when I say Eurovision semi-final two, this is on the running order that I did a couple of weeks ago. I also open with Malta. I also close with the Netherlands. Um, I also think I have Norway second last, but we'll see. Uh, so Malta first with Loop, then Albania with Titan, Greece with Zari, Switzerland with the Code, Czechia with Pedestal, and then France with Mon Amour. So. Yeah, very good. Then Austria with We Will Rave, Denmark with Sand, Armenia with Jaco, Latvia with Hollow, Spain with Zora. First half of semi-final two, then Malta, fine. Albania, Greece, Switzerland, Czechia. It's not the strongest start, but then France, Austria, Denmark is a powerful run. Uh, Armenia, Latvia, meh, meh, Spain, meh. Then we have San Marino, Georgia, Belgium, Estonia, Italy, Israel, Norway, Netherlands. So, yeah, I think semi-final one is stronger than semi-final two, but only just. They are pretty evenly matched. I think the run of uh, France, Austria, Denmark is probably the strongest run. Oh, mind you. Italy, Israel, Norway, Netherlands could be a pretty strong run, depending on your opinions on Israel's power ballad or Norway's kind of gothic uh, pop rock thing. Um, but, yeah, I think ending with the Netherlands, there was there was... It had to. That was an absolute no-brainer ending with the Netherlands. Um, I've seen a lot of comments in all of these about uh, how the running order of the semi-finals, how there's death spots in the semi-finals, um, which I've got to say I disagree with completely. Whilst I think the running order can make a big difference in the final and the semi-finals, I, I disagree. I completely disagree. I think... I mean, now that we don't have juries anymore, maybe... Uh, but I generally there's one or two big surprises each year, and that's about it. But like, I, I, there, there, there's some people that are like, "Oh my god, I can't believe Serbia have got second now. They won't qualify. Serbia will probably qualify because there's a much worse songs in that semi final. But if they don't qualify, oh no, like, mm, I, I think I think the semi finals are usually very good at weeding out the absolute trash." But Serbia isn't. So, you know, I don't think Serbia's got much to worry about. I think I look at these and, you know, from semi-final two, I think Netherlands, Norway, uh, 
Belgium, San Marino, Latvia, Denmark, Austria, Czechia, Switzerland, and although I don't like it, probably Greece, but people seem to be liking good Greece or Armenia, I reckon. I don't think both that those are the ten I reckon will get through. Um depending on people's position on Israel, they they, they might get through it as well. But for Eden Golan's sake, I hope they don't. Uh, because you know it's gonna be a hell of a reaction in the hall if if they do qualify. Uh, yeah, so that is the running order then. So big, big Doctor Who news for the first time in a long, long time. We got another trailer, which is much more what I was, uh, much more kind of up my street and alley. We get a bigger showcase of Shooty's Doctor, the kind of the darker side that's in there as well. Um, with the line about, you know, I'll turn this battlefield to dust, which is sensational. Um, he's crying as he says it, which is quite interesting. Um, Ruby is, you know, looking, she's there. Uh, I think as much as I love the church on Ruby Road, I'm I'm not completely convinced by Ruby yet. I think it's a shame that she's only really going to get one season, you know, of eight episodes to to really ram it in. But but I think I think the problem is it doesn't really matter who you put up against. Shooty Shooty's going to steal the show, and I think that's important. I think. In the same way that it didn't matter who you put up against Tom Baker, Tom Baker was going to steal the show. Um, and I think it's it's been that long since we've had a Doctor who is straight up going to own every single scene they're in from day one to the point that they uh, to the point that they leave. And um, but yeah, massive Doctor Who news on top of the trailer, which was very very good. We have the titles, writers, and directors of all eight episodes of season one, stroke series fourteen. Uh, if you do, if for whatever reason you are uh, avoiding all this stuff, which is absolutely fair play. Um, spoilers here. There will be time codes in the description. So if you don't want to know anything about the upcoming season of Doctor Who whatsoever, skip ahead. So. The opener is called Space Babies, which I think is a phenomenal little title. Uh, we have some quotes from Russell J. Davis saying it's been amazing to see the whole world appreciate uh, Galva's talents. This is uh, Golda Rocheval, who is the uh, one of the one of the uh, guest cast that's been announced uh, playing Jocelyn. Uh, appreciate Golda's talents because of Bridget and it's been an absolute joy to invite her to Cardiff to help launch Shooty and Millie's first season. So, Space Babies, written by... Oh, they, so, written by Russell T. Davies, directed by Julianne Robinson, guest starring Golda Rocheval, the Doctor and Ruby's first adventure brings them to a space station containing a group of talking babies, but there are also horrific-looking creatures in the corridors. So, this we've seen a lot of this in the trailers. looks very, very good. Uh... Yeah, and I think if this is if this is the villain of the piece, phenomenal. Uh, second episode starring Jinx Monsoon is The Devil's Chord, also written by Russell T. Davies, directed by Ben Chessel, guest starring Jinx Monsoon. The most powerful foe the Doctor has ever faced is stalking the famous Abbey Road in the 1960s. Can the Doctor and Ruby save the Beatles and keep human history on track? Sounds phenomenal. Third episode is called Boom, directed by Julianne Robinson and written by... Stephen Moffat. So our heroes find themselves on a desolate planet in the middle of someone else's war, reported to feature the return of the clerics, uh, which made their which were in um the Angel Two part in series five, and they're in a good man goes to war as well, weren't they? So I mean, they'd be an interesting thing to bring back. I mean, why not? First episode not written by Russell T Davies, there by Mister Moffat. Episode 4, 73 Yards, written by Russell T. Davies, directed by Dylan Holmes Williams, guest starring Anurin Bernard as Roger App William and Gemma Redgrave as Kate Stewart. The TARDIS returns to a present where things seem to become more supernatural day by day. The trailer teases this episode may feature a TARDIS. Skies is a lab post. Do we have another uh, Time Lord? Be amazing if we did. Uh, the fact that we are leaning heavily into the fantasy element, I, I just can't wait for. Um, what I'm also loving is we've got Space Babies, which is probably going to be future. Devil's Chord, which is history. Boom, which is, again, you know, uh, space. And then we're back to the present day. Russell T. Davies straight away bringing back the, the 
the way Doctor Who should always be, because we've already opened with it, because um, the Christmas special was our present day opener with the uh, new companion, we can start our new season somewhere different, but you go future, history, space, present day, future, history, space, present day. That is pretty much how he always introduced new companions, and there is a reason it works. It is brilliant. So good to see that's coming back. Episode 5, Dot and Bubble, also written by Russell T. Davies, if you're keeping count. That's four of the five written by him so far. Directed by Dylan Holmes Williams, probably the episode about which the least has been officially released so far. Episode 6 is titled Rogue, written by Kate Heron and Bryony Redman, directed by Ben Chissel, guest starring Jonathan Groff and Indira Varma as the Duchess. Ruby gets to live out her greatest Bridgerton fantasies, with added bird-like aliens on the prowl. And who is the mysterious, charming rogue played by Jonathan Groff? Seems like there is a glorious amount of sexual tension between Jonathan Groff's character and the Doctor, which I adore. I also adore the outfits in this. It looks uh, this, this looks like a... Uh, like the sort of historical the BBC was famous for in the late 80s. It looks like this is kind of the, the vibe we're going for, which I adore. Uh, episode 7, part 1 of a two-part finale. The Legend of Ruby Sunday, written by, you guessed it, Russell T. Davies. Directed by Jamie Donoghue. The start of the two-part finale, guest starring Gemma Redgrave as Kate Stewart, Yasmin Finney as Rose Noble, and Bonnie Langford as Mel Bush. Unit brings the Doctor and Ruby home, but soon they're in the fight of their lives with the whole world at stake. And the finale is called Empire of Death, which is just a stunning title. Again, written by Russell D. Davies and directed again by Jamie Donahue. The series concludes in undoubtedly the high-stakes, high-emotion fashion we've come to expect from Russell the Davies. Russell's writing six of these, which is just insane to me. Um, the two episodes he's not written one of them he's given to Stephen Moffat which I adore, I love that Moffat's come back uh, with zero exception Girl in the Fireplace is the only one that is up for debate but, I th but for me with zero exception Moffat's episodes with Russell in charge were the best episodes of Russell's seasons um, Empty Child Doctor Dances Beyond standard. Girl in the Fireplace is a phenomenal episode in a pretty crap season. Uh, Blink is, you know, it's Blink. Is it my favourite? Not particularly. Do I think the run from human nature to Last of the Time Lords is one of the best in Doctor Who's history? You're damn right I do. Silence of the Library, Forest of the Dead. Two of my favourite episodes ever. Do I think the run from Silence of the Library to Journey's End is as strong as Series 3? No. Mainly because I think Turn Left and the 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 Series 4 finale are... They don't quite hit as hard for me as Last of the Time Lords. I'm not as attached to Davros as I am the Master. Uh, also, when I... when I, like, I remember being a child and watching Derek Jacobi regenerate into John Sim. And that was my first proper regeneration. Because um, I missed... <laughs> When I say I missed the regeneration from Echoes into Tenant, uh, I was watching it in my I was watching Parting of the Ways in my grand's bedroom. Um and uh like the, the, the Ariel was playing up. Um so for those of you who don't know, aerials were a thing that you used to have to put on the back of your TV. Uh yeah, so the signal the signal to the TV was playing up. So this is before digital when uh you literally you had to have a signal come into your home rather than through the internet. Uh, yeah, and the area was playing up, <clears throat> and so I, I had kind of kept like swapping channels to try and make it work and whatnot. Um, and so when I got back to it and I saw somebody else, uh, kind of standing in roughly what kind of looked like the TARDIS set, but it was tough to tell. I just thought the channel had changed, and I didn't realize that anything had really gone awry. Uh, series two, I think the back end of series two is when I started to really pay attention. To Doctor Who, um, I thought the idea of Cybermen and Daleks together was was just fascinating, and then Series Three, I paid a lot of attention to. Back end of Series Three is where I became a proper Whovian, and then Series Four was the first series where I was like, right, I'm I'm on everything. Let's torch with Sarah Jane. This classic series, give me all the Doctor Who. Uh, yeah, so amazing that Moffat's back. 
I think it's pretty interesting that the only other episode has two writers. Uh, now, when I when I look at this, I think that is a lot of work, Russell. Like that is a lot of work. But then there's a there's a three part interview um, from Stephen Moffat to the official Doctor Who YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. Where he the the interviewer God I can't remember her name. She's one of the co hosts on um on the on the Doctor Who podcast. She asks, you know, what what's the toughest part of your job? And Moffat said scripts. Moffat's like talking about how he took his eye off the ball for, you know, the Dalek redesign and that, you know, most of his job was just fixing scripts and writing scripts and editing scripts down. And, you know, he was he said himself he was notoriously late with his own scripts. When you're the showrunner, that's pretty hard. But most of his most of his job was was taking scripts and you know because the, the the job of the showrunner like back in the day there wasn't a showrunner there was two people doing what was effectively one person's job now you had a producer and you had a script editor the script editor was the person that was fixing the scripts the producer was the one making you know the big uh calling the big shots and whatnot obviously as television has moved on you have that be the same person because you know the person that is running the show writing the scripts is also the person that has the you know biggest creative control over everything back in the day that was say split between john nathan turner and eric sayward now it is russell t davis does the whole thing moffat does the whole thing chibnall does the whole thing russell t davis does the whole thing again so knowing that scripts is the biggest part of the job um it makes sense that russell's written six of them himself because he'll know that Moffat's one, he will know how Moffat works. He will know the revisions he'll need to make to Moffat's. If any, he'll know he can send it back. Um, he'll also, like, Moffat's always been very good at, like, budgets and stuff. It'll also be probably quite nice for Moffat to be like, wait, I can write an episode where the budget's, like, huge? Yay! Um, so I reckon Kate Hearn and Brian Redman will be the one where he put the most effort in, um, in terms of, like, making sure the script is up to scratch. Um... But that's two, you know, relatively new writers getting to cut their teeth. A lot of new directors in here as well, which is brilliant. Um, yeah, I just, I, lo I love Russell's approach to this season of, he's wrote six of the episodes, lovely jubbly. Um, he's pretty hands-on as an executive producer. He tends to be on set pretty much every day, looking stuff over, Um. If, if if his first stint on Doctor Who is anything to go by, very excited. And the fact that he's got Phil Collinson and Julie Gardner there as well, you know, is pretty much the entire creative team that was there uh, from seasons one to four in the specials. I'm psyched. I'm absolutely psyched. I think getting all these details is, uh, has made me more excited for this season of Doctor Who. I was... Not that I wasn't excited... But I was I was muted excited. After after the first um after the first uh trailer I was I was a bit unfussed and I thought, eh, okay. Um but the the second trailer is absolutely absolutely spot on what I would uh what I want and what I like. So yeah. So semi final two then. So first thing I will do is let me just run through what my running order was. So it was Malta, Albania, Armenia, Switzerland, Austria, France, Spain, Greece, Czechia, Denmark, Norway, Italy, Belgium, Georgia, Estonia, Israel, Latvia, San Marino, Netherlands. Not a million miles away from what the uh, the actual one is, actually. That's that's a lot closer than semi-final one, I feel. Um so, <clears throat> Malta, Sarah Bonici with Luke. I'm all in, but the b -b -b blame is on you. I'm a tease and, oh God, you love it when I m -m -m move. In your head all night, you've got me on loop. Now, I think that's changed since the revamp. Um, the live version is fine. The vocals are nothing to really scream home about. The song's all right. Uh, the, the dancing's pretty impressive. So yeah, uh, 7285, giving Malta 22 out of 40. Uh, second place is Albania, Besa with Titan. I won't give up, fight till the end. Every tear's gonna ricochet. I rise, rise. I'm a Titan, well credits, in disguise. Uh, I mean, she's a half-decent singer, but the song's boring. The 
staging is dull as hell. 4.5, 7.5, 6, 2, given Albania, 20 out of 40. Uh, 3, Armenia, Ladaniva with Jacko. They tell me, Jacko, be humble. Don't talk too much. Don't stay too quiet. Wear this, open this, close that, behave like a girl. But I am a free girl, so I will dance and you will watch. Stunning lyrics to a god-awful song. This, uh... The, this in Greece are are the the type of the the type of genre that I I just can't stand. I don't like the quality of the voice in in this type of music. I don't like the kind of amelodical approach to the singing. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it's it's beyond. It's not my cup of tea at all. Uh, sometimes Armenia for me send bangers, sometimes they send they send misses. Three, two, four, and four, giving this 13 out of 40. Switzerland, Nemo with the code. I went to hell and back to find myself on track. I broke the code. Whoa. Like heaven eyes, I just gave it some time. Now I feel paradise. This is a tough one. Um There was recently uh a live performance of this uh, at the the ESC concert in Spain, um, and he's he's a stunning singer. He is a stunning singer. Um, no, the top comment in the music video was you know the guy changes out. No, sorry, it's not top comment. It's a guy called Kevin Babbles. If you don't know who that is, go look him up. He's uh, it's like twenty seven or twenty eight things to be excited for in this year's Eurovision, and it is absolutely fucking hilarious. Um. And it's the guy changes genre as much as he changes his clothes as much as the song changes genre, which is very accurate. Uh, typically, that hasn't worked in Eurovision playing with genre around that much, but this this is a absolute Frankenstein's monster of a song. Um, but he sings it really well, and his rapping is sensational, and his operatic stuff is unreal. Like vocally, he is sensational, and. Switzerland tends to do quite well with the juries anyway, and I think they'll do really well with the juries this year. We we might have actually found something which the juries might might win the jury vote. Uh, there's no doubt for me that this will qualify. Now we uh judged the music video, and the rule for the music video was for vocal, uh, whatever you gave it, you half it because it's a music video. So you're basically just kind of going on the tone and whatnot. 6.5, 5, 6, and 6. That's a 5 for the vocal on the music video. Having watched him live, yeah. His vocal, if he can do in May what he did in Spain, that vocal is a 10 out of 10 without a shadow of a doubt. It's a stunning. Absolutely stunning. Uh, 5 for me. Then we had Austria. Colleen with We Will Rave. When the darkness hits and we can't be saved, we ram de dum dum and we will rave. When our hearts are burning, we feel no pain. We ram de dum dum then we will rave. Right up my alley, this. This is right up my alley. This is one of my favourite songs in the whole competition this year. I absolutely adore it. I love a rave song. Um, live, she seems fine. Uh, again, we, you know, judge the music video. Um, the dancing looks incredible. Yeah, this is... Uh, to me, this is an easy qualifier, but I guess we'll see. So, 9477. Given Austria, 27 out of 40. Switzerland was 23 and a half out of 40. Uh, then I put France with Slimane with Mon Amour, which is my love. I love you. I don't know why. I replay the scene, but it's always the same ending that starts again. You don't hear my sorrow. What do we do with it? Do you love me or not? This is a dark horse. This in Denmark, I think, are the absolute dark horses of the competition and with stunning performances, could find themselves in the top five. Predicting a top five in the, the exact order, I don't know, but I think Croatia, Italy, Netherlands, France, uh, Switzerland will be in the top five. Um, and I think Denmark should be sneaking in there as well, but we'll see. This is a beautiful song by a astounding singer who gives an amazingly emotional performance and looks great while doing it. Uh, the male uh, the male Barbara Pravi uh, 
for me, I think. And I wasn't I wasn't too fussed on Babs's performance in twenty one. But this is on par with that, I, I would say. Like I, I I get like my wife adored Babs. Like she thought that was just the best performance you've ever, you've ever seen. This to me is is up there. It can it gives me um Israel's entry in twenty oh nineteen. Like his his perform he was stuck. like the fact that he did so badly was heartbreaking. He was brilliant. Uh, eight point five nine, eight point five nine, giving France thirty five out of forty. Then we have Spain Nebulosa with Zora, which is slut. If I go out alone, I'm the slut. If I have fun, the sluttiest. If I take time and last until the day comes, I'm even more of a slut. Lyrics sensational. Melody, beautiful. Choreography, stunning. The visuals for the whole thing, what they're wearing is beautiful. Oh my god, the only thing that lets us down is the fact that she cannot sing for shit. And if she could, I would say this would be in contention for top five as well. As it is, I think it's still doing really well. I think left-hand side of the board, um, I think it's it's a, it's a cracking entry from Spain, this. Uh... The juries will not go for this at all because she cannot sing to save herself. But, I mean, I reckon this will be in my top 10 because 10 for song, 10 for performance, 10 for visuals, one and a half for the vocal. I hated it. I just, she cannot sing to save herself. So 31 and a half out of 40, which is not bad for someone who can't sing. Uh, then Greece, Marina Sati with Zari, which is dice. Where's the wind going to take us? I'm falling and rolling about like dice. I'm pretending to forget your scent. And everything's changing around me. Song itself isn't an advertisement for Greece, but the music video is. Uh, and because we were judging on the music video, that that massively hampered my opinion of this song. Uh, I think it's crap. I, I think this might be one of the worst songs in this. I mean, it's not as bad as Iceland's. Iceland makes me want to cry. But it might be the second worst song for me this year. I think it's just uh, uh, Estonia's is dreadful. Uh, yeah, I I hate this. I absolutely hate this. Uh, I think the vocal is crap. I think the song is crap. I think you know visuals for our music video that is just an advertisement for Greece. <laughs> uh, I mean, she looks like she might be able to dance, so that's something. So zero for song two, four zero for visuals. So that's six out of forty for Greece. Following that up was the live performance from Czechia with Aiko's pedestal. I need to learn to put myself on a pedestal. I will be loving me more. I finally learn not to force things and I love me more. Love me more than your bullshit. Uh, again, another, you know, there's some absolutely banging lyrics this year for, for female empowerment. Like, absolutely stunning, which I absolutely adore. It's a shame that most of them are sung by people who can't sing. But oh well. Oh well. Uh, song's alright, vocal was crap, performance was a bit all over the shop and it didn't look that great. 4-2-4-2, um, four, two, four, two. 12 out of 40 for Czechia. Uh, Denmark, Saba with sand, shouldn't be so hard, like breathing underwater, maybe we've been in the blue. Didn't see it coming, falling into nothing, ain't there something we can do? I can feel you slipping through my hands, guess we built a castle out of sand. Uh, I'll cut to the chase. Uh, me and my wife gave this 40 out of 40. Flawless. Flawless. Song is beautiful. Vocal was perfection. Performance was exactly what it needed to be. Visuals were astounding. This was the first song uh, this year that I really got attached to. And I still love it as much as I did a couple months back. Um, I hope... With all my heart, that this does well, I worry that, I mean, I, I think it'll qualify, but then I worry it'll just kind of, you know, be bottom five, bottom six. I worry. I pray that this gets somewhere in the top ten. I want this to do as well as Rasmussen's Higher Ground, which I think came eighth or ninth, I can't remember which. If this can be top five, I would be overjoyed, but... This is going to be a hard Eurovision to win or do well in. This is one of the, song-wise, this is one of the strongest Eurovisions we've had in a while. 
I would argue since 21, 21 was really stacked. And 20, 2016 was just off the charts. So, yeah, we, uh, we'll we see. We'll see. I hope it does really, really well. I really, really do. It's one of my favorites. Like I said, 10s across the board. Love it. And 11th, then, we had Norway. Uh, got it with Uvaham, which is wolfskin. She gave me the skin of a grey wolf. She cursed me to walk the forest alone and never become whole and good, for I had drunk my brother's blood. Dum diggy da, but I said we had wolfskin. Um, so, because I wanted Kano to win the national final so badly, I didn't really give this a, a fair chance at the time. So, watching it for this was the first time I've watched it all the way through. Uh, watching the national final performance, and I was blown away. I was like, wow, okay, do you know what? Norway are looking for another top 10, and they're probably going to get it. This is, uh, you know, the song isn't entirely my, you know, I wouldn't listen to it, but it's a good song. The vocal was pretty good, a couple of missed notes here and there. The performance was, you know, I think it's a bit goofy, but it's 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 very, very good for the song she's singing. And visual-wise, I mean, whoa, like they knocked her at the park. Uh, 7, 8, 8, 10. 33 out of 40 for Norway, which, uh, given how biased I was against it, I was surprised they gave it a mark that high, but hey-ho. Uh, 12, Italy. Angelina Mango with Lanoia, which is boredom. I die because dying makes days more human. I live because suffering makes joys greater. We can only laugh during these scorched nights. A thorned crown will be the dress code for my party. Um, Italy... If you listen to the episode where I talk about the how I would revise the big five, Italy have been at the top of that for a few years now. Um, like they've had the most points over the past five years on average. Not even not on average, sorry. They've just had cumulative, they've had the most points over everyone with Sweden now becoming a bit of a close second. Um and the reason is is that San Remo isn't a platform for Eurovision in the same way, like the reason why Italy and Sweden are at the top. Melody Festival isn't a platform for Eurovision. It is a platform for artists to get their song out into the charts. San Remo was the same. Although this year, San Remo was a little bit different. It was a, it felt like it was a touch more skewed to Eurovision, but me, me, me. Um, the whole point of both of these is that they're just festivals of music. Um, the winner of Melody Festival gets first for few, well, if you win Melody Festival and part of the contract of entering is that you will then represent Sweden. With Italy, you get first refusal. You, If you win San Remo, doesn't mean you're going to Eurovision. You have the choice as an artist whether you want to go or not. Um, as such, since 2017, Italy have, you know, regularly been inside the top 10. If not top 5, if not fighting for the win. This year will be no different. This is my wife's favourite song of the year. Um... And the lyrics are sensational, absolutely sensational. The song, the melody is brilliant. The vocals are on point. The performance is perfect. The visuals are perfect. What she wears in the national final is gorgeous. I've come round on the dancing. Now that I know about, that can be as a style of dancing rather than just a random Italian word. I reckon, for me, I've, I've said this a, a lot in the past few weeks, my opinion has unchanged. This this Eurovision is between Italy and Croatia. But I think Netherlands might be sneaking in there as well, I think. I think Netherlands will probably win the televote. When you Croatia could still, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I, rec I reckon it's still between Italy and Croatia, but I think Netherlands is is right up there. Um, my my gut feeling would be that Italy will probably win, but hey, who knows? If Italy cut, if, if they decide to put Italy in second place, Italy isn't winning. If they decide to put Croatia in second place, Croatia isn't winning. Uh, and the running order, I should say, for the final, <clears throat> second place has never won. And that's why earlier when I was like, why do people? Think the running order in the semis makes a difference because it really doesn't, but in the final it makes a huge difference. And now they choose where things go. So anyway, yeah. So Italy nine point five across the board, thirty eight out of forty. That will 
that's probably going to be a 40 come the come Eurovision. Um, the song is just getting better and better for me. Uh, and unless she forgets how to sing between now and then, I reckon that'll go up to a 10 as well. So next is Belgium. Musty, before the party is over, I've got a soul on fire. I'm going to make moves tonight. I've got a soul on fire before the party is over. It's a bit boring, really. Especially where I placed it coming after Italy. Like this, this was just a big pile of meh. Uh, although I think the I think the last like 30, 40 seconds of the song was a lot better than the first two minutes. You always want to end strong rather than begin strong, but you know, ideally you just make a good fucking song the whole way through. Uh because it was a music video, vocals obviously get halved. Um they seemed fine. Uh the performance was again a touch goofy and the visuals were a bit odd and you know, naked with red lights and Prance and Beth, yeah, okay. not, 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 not for me. Uh, seven, three point five, six and four, giving Belgium twenty point five out of forty. Uh, then we had Georgia, uh, Nutsa Buzladze with Firefighter. I see it in the air. I see it in the air. I'm rising from these ashes like a phoenix. Yeah, you know I'll be there. You know that I'll be there. I'm running through these ashes like your firefighter. Uh, she's gorgeous. <clears throat> she is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, the song is fine, I guess. The dancing in the music video was incredible, and they are all very, very beautiful people. Um, can't really remember the song. Six, three, ten, and ten. 29 out of 40 for Georgia, mainly on the strength of uh, how attractive the lead singer and backing dancers are, and uh, the choreography in the music video. I'm sure the song's fine. Uh, next up, then, I had Estonia. Now, bear with me, because I, I will get this wrong. So it's five minutes and pull up. Nendesh narkotikumidesh eti me kul medagi. Of these drugs, we really don't know anything. Listen to this now. We can go howling. We will be heard today. But take this bag away. I don't know drugs. I know lemonade and cider. I couldn't tell vitamin and speed apart. Um. Yeah, so we don't know anything about these drugs. Um, it's a weird song. It's a weird, weird song. Uh, it's not a good song. It is a bad song. Melody, sure. I'm sure there's one in there. Uh, the fact that in the national final, when they were prancing around the audience, there's a bunch of like 12, 11, 10 year olds singing about how, you know, oh, we don't know anything about these drugs. Ha 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 ha. Yeah, we do. Like that's what the, the song is about, you know. No, we put uh, drugs, we 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 don't know anything about drugs with all the fucking furore over Windows 95 man's logo and Israel's lyrics definitely not fucking being about Palestine at all. And yet this song is literally about yeah, no, nope, drugs are fine. And we've got a song from Spain literally titled Slut. I mean, uh the EBU need to fucking slap around the face with the things that they are and aren't okay with. I don't, I, I mean, again, I don't think anything should be banned. Like, keep the keep the song in, you know? Let it fucking tank. Let it fucking tank. Hopefully this comes last, because it is shit. If it was a really brilliant song, fine. But, like, the, the, the guys on stage look like they're fucking high off their nut. And, the, 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 I say, the song's crap. The singing is, the, what is singing? The visuals are boring as fuck. I mean, there's some energy, so they get a few points for energy. One, one, four, one. Seven out of 40 for Estonia. I really, really hate this entry. Uh, Israel then. Eden Golan with Hurricane. <clears throat> Hurricane. Every day I'm losing my mind, holding on in this mysterious ride. Dancing in the storm, I got nothing to hide. Take it out and leave the world behind. Baby, promise me you'll hold me again. I'm still broken from this October, uh, from this hurricane. So, uh, unsurprisingly, an underwhelming power ballad from Israel. Are we surprised? All the fuss for a pretty boring song. Uh, I mean, it's fine. The lyrics are a bit witchy and, um, you know, oh, life is so hard. Ah. Uh, she seems like she's going to be a cracking singer, though. I mean, she won The Voice, so she's going to be very good singing-wise. Um, the visuals weren't my cup of tea in the performance. Just, again, I worry this is going to be... Um, 
on par with Russia's What If We All Put Down Our Guns song from 2013, um, you know, which which was just a fucking hilarious song that they sent in after they, you know, invaded Crimea and they went, well, why don't we all just put our guns down, guys? Yeah, yeah. This has got the same vibe for me. The difference is, What If We All Put Down Our Arms was a banging tune. <laughs> that was a great song. This isn't. Uh, 4433, 14 out of 40 for Israel this year. Uh, next, then I had Sam Marino, uh, Megara, 1111. Uh, you'll be able to jump the whole night. Come and give me a reason for me to want to change these voices. You know, some of them lie and others don't. I don't give a fuck because if you don't want me, other people will. But I said, Arcadia is a much better song than this. Um, but I think this is going to be a pretty easy qualification for Sam Marino. I don't think they need to worry about this one at all. Uh, and songs boring, vocals are fine, the performance is fine, the visuals is where this really stands out. Uh, it's a gorgeous visual style, it's right up my street. Um, the the kind of punk goth, the pink and the black, when they take their masks off the back and dancers, and they've got that kind of like weird white prosthetic. Oh, oh I think it's great. Um, uh, but you know, it's another one of those where the visuals kind of bump the song up, but in a relatively weak semi-final, I don't think Sam Reno has much to worry about this year. 4, 6, 5, 9, 24 out of 40. Uh, Latvia then. Uh, Dawns with Hollow. It's killing me slow. Try to make me just another believer. Everybody just pretending they're preachers. I'd rather let them dig my grave shallow instead of selling out to something so hollow, like all my clones attacking me. Um, Boring song. Really boring song. Really dull performance. He's wearing a boiler suit. But, man, the dude can sing. Like, he can really sing. Um, in terms of his vocal performances, it's his best in Latvia's national final. I watched the video where the other five or six he's done, and this is his best by a long shot. Um, juries might like this. Uh, the fact that there aren't any juries in the semi-final means Latvia probably won't qualify with this. But, I mean, yeah, the vocals are great. Just everything else is crap. 4, 8, 4, 2, giving this 18 out of 40. And then last but not least, in both mine and actual, Netherlands, used Klein with Echo Papa. Now, the lyrics that I've included here are not in the uh, radio edit of the song. They are in the music video edit and what we hope will be in the Eurovision performance. I hope they don't cut this out. So after the kind of like rave bit, and he goes, Echo Pa, and that's the end of the song in the radio edit, there is a section uh, where he's standing in the burning house and he says, at the end of the day, we're all human beings. My father once told me it's a world without borders. I miss you every day and I whisper secretly, do you see now, Dad? I listen to you. Now, this whole song is just sensational. Uh... It's just brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, if he nails the live performance, and that's the important thing, if the staging is good, if he, you know, sings or graps it perfectly, if he is as camp as he needs to be, and he needs to be really camp with this, and then drops it for those last, like, 10 seconds, um, I see, like, at that point, I would put the Netherlands in contention for the win. Because we've got a live version of Italy, because we've got a live version of Croatia, we know what they're both going to look like. They're they're fighting for the win. When we see what Netherlands has got at that point is when I think this will... Uh, yeah, it's at that point that I think this will become in, in contention for me for a, potentially to win, uh, which would be fine. I think it would be an absolute laugh if the Netherlands went from, you know, Duncan Lawrence's arcade, this gorgeous power ballad, to... Uh, <laughs> Ejo Papa. <laughs> Two very different songs, but what I love about this, like Croatia's is, you know, just a, a, a kind of upbeat pop rock song, but it's got a really good message behind it. This is an upbeat pop, then rave, trance, dance, lovely, you know, Euro pop song where the message is literally welcome to Europe and, uh, you know, stay here till I die. Um... You know, Europe, Europe, yay. You know, oh, you can go here and here. Oh, I don't have my passport, but that's okay because we're all part of the European Union. Yeah. And we all, we all eat things and, 
yeah, right, that this is the world we live in, right? Right. Uh, there's just this constant dark undertone of... Um, and that's why I love this bit at the end of, you know, my dad... You know, at the end of the day, we're all human. I mean, literally... You know, my dad once said, you know, that this should be a world that doesn't have borders. And I think that is just a, a stunning message. And I think if this wins, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, God, actually, maybe as a Netherlands really in contention this year. And I think it is, you know, I really do think it is. Um, it's just a stunning man. Like this, the entire song is just, but like I said, this undercurrent of darkness of, is this actually the world we live in? Like, are we actually in a world where we love and care for each other? Do we actually appreciate each other as human beings? Do we actually live in a world without borders or do we not? Um, which is brilliant. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I'm like, maybe I want Evelyn's to win. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so obviously just um just the music video then, so the vocal does get halved. Uh, it's a tough vocal to judge on this, uh, but the song ten, uh, performance ten, vocal two point five, uh, and visuals for me was an eight. They were ten for my wife. I, I would now give it a ten for visuals. I, I took a little while to get used to the big bloody shoulder pads, and this was my first time watching the like the, the seeing the song in its entirety for the first time was giving it this so obviously all of these were a couple of weeks ago now i would say most of these would change on a second rewatch but netherlands 30.5 out of 40 my the 19 then so six will not qualify uh, so i have greece at the bottom with six points then estonia in 18th czechia in 17th armenia 16th israel 15th latvia 14th i I know some of that will move. Like I said, I don't think Greece or Romania should be anywhere near the final. I know at least one of them will be fine. Um, as such, my qualifiers then, 13th place, uh, Albania with 20, then Belgium in 12th, Malta in 11th, Switzerland 10th, San Marino 9th, Austria 8th, Georgia 7th, Netherlands 6th. Like I said, that will change big time in the in the night. Um. So that means that in this semi final, the big the three the 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 three members of the big five that are performing are in my top five. Like the big five have really really pulled it out this year. So Spain in fifth with thirty one and a half, Norway in fourth with thirty three, France in third with thirty five, Italy in second with thirty eight, and topping both mine and my wife's is Denmark with forty. So across the board, then Sweden is the only member. Of the big five and automatic qualifiers that we gave that I gave a score less than thirty two, which is pretty it was a pretty impressive showing from the big five. Uh, generally there's one or two which I think are utter tripe, and there's one that I think is brilliant, and then the rest are you know meh. Um, yeah, so it's nice to see the big five taking it seriously. So the qualifiers then, if we were to mix both mine and my wife's scores, uh, Greece, Estonia, Czechia, Armenia, and Israel would all still not qualify. But we would swap Albania and Latvia. She loved his voice. Absolutely loved it. Um, I think she gave it a 10 for vocal, actually. Uh, then we go, yeah, Latvia, Malta, Belgium, San Marino, Switzerland, Austria, Georgia, Spain, Norway, Netherlands, France, Italy, Denmark. More or less the same. I think Netherlands has moved up a wee bit there. Yeah, now, do I think that's what it's actually going to look like on the night? Absolutely not. I don't I I I don't even think that'll be our scores on the night, but I think either way, um either way, this is a this is a great Eurovision. This is a great Eurovision. Uh I'm psyched. I'm I'm like really, really psyched. It's it's I'm always psyched for Eurovision. And I think one of the things I did differently this year was I didn't pay attention to every national final I was going to, then I didn't. Uh, I think the fact that Melody Festival was was piss poor this year helped me just kind of go, ugh, oh, meh. And then Kino didn't qualify, and I was like, ugh, oh, meh. And then Melovin didn't qualify, and I was like, well, what am I doing? Um, and then I just kind of, you know, stayed, not stayed away purposefully, but I just kind of drifted in and out. You know, the songs that I liked, I liked great. The songs I didn't, I didn't really pay much attention to. Uh, and then sitting down with my wife and going, right, these are the four hours that we're well, two and a half hours that we're gonna set. We're gonna you know listen to the whole shebang, 
um, and give everything like proper attention uh, so that come the so in a month's time when we actually have Eurovision um, you know we, know we we kind of know what's going on we know what we're expecting some years it's literally just the songs I like that I play on repeat and then the rest there's like ooh slow burners uh, but I mean already you know Ukraine is, is going on us um, in a really really big way yeah should be an exciting year uh, so what is Sean up to? What's Sean up to? What Sean's up to? However you want to say it. Watching nothing new, really. This week has just been Brooklyn Nine Nine and uh, a lot of YouTube. Um, listen to the Weekly Planet, which is a, just a wonderful podcast of two Australian blokes just having a laugh, chatting about uh, comic books, movies, TV shows, video games, everything I'm interested in. Uh, and then, yeah, Brooklyn Nine-Nine, which is one of my, one of, if not my all-time favourite uh, show, especially just to have on in the background and to put on while you're eating, you know, something that's easy to watch and that you know really well. Used to be friends. Uh, it's not that. I'm sure something else will take over in 10 years' time. What have I been playing then? I mean, I've been playing a lot of random stuff. Uh... Wild Arms are still going strong. Uh, try Legend of the uh, the Legend of Dragoon or the Legend of 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 the Dragoons. I don't know. It was it was just a very cheap imitation of Final Fantasy. Uh, very obviously a cheap imitation of Final Fantasy, and I did not did not care for it at all. Um, I've been redoing some of the early Gen One Nuzlocke's. Uh, Red. How far did I get with Red and Blue? Oh, red, I got to Agatha. Oh, that's painful. Blue, I died to Erica. Uh, yellow, died to Misty. So just getting worse and worse. Um, Pokemon Gold was going really well, actually. I, I struggled with Gen 2, mainly because it's just choices, really. A lot of choices. And with Generation 2, if you're doing a Nuzlocke for Generation 2, you have to really... You have to accept that you're going to do a bit of grinding in the first little bit, um, and then once you get, once you get to Whitney, and can get past Whitney, and I've now got a pretty foolproof plan for beating Win for beating Whitney, which I was stunned that worked in gold. I'm now doing a silver one, um. Yeah, the reason I lost the gold nuzlocke was. Once I'd beaten Morty and I had Surf, I was out right. Let's let's go do all the things I can do before before I use Surf. You know, every Pokemon was at level 24, 25, 26. And then there's a bit just to the left of the daycare center where you can surf down and there's three women there who'll who'll fight you. I can't remember what the prize is at the bottom of the beach. But they completely decimated me. Completely not. They were much higher levels than I was expecting. Uh, the last the last lady had a level twenty eight star me, which I just had fuck all to add nothing in retaliation to it. Like I had nothing at all. It just bubble beam my entire team into the ground, and I was very sad. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I'm making that mistake again. But like the first couple of times I did gold, uh, like so. But I think the first time I did silver, I died to Bugsy because I didn't pick Cyndaquil. And I didn't get a geodude, or I lost. I think I lost the geodude to, to in the Bell Sprout Tower. Um, I have, I have like what what I've what I've loved about doing Pokemon Nuzlocke is how it changes the way I play in such a big way. And I've said that before, but uh, like I used to just be four attacking moves. I mean, I used to just be four attacking moves that were snap, which is that. Like you go. One powerful stab attack and move. If you're a dual type, you have two of them, and then you have two for coverage. Uh, whereas now I tend to try and keep at least one status move, like to inflict paralysis or sleep or poison or something. Usually paralysis or sleep. Poison I'm not too fussed on. Sleep is the I love I love sending them to sleep. Just give me a couple of just give me a couple of turns to figure out what I'm doing with my life. Um, yeah. So the the what I managed to do with with Whitney is I sent out Geodid first. So the other thing with Nuz Nuzlocke, of course, is the level cap. So none of my Pokemon are higher than level 20 when we go and fight, uh, when we go fight Whitney. If they level up to 21 during the Whitney fight, fine. Um, so the defense curl rollout combo is a combo I've never really cared about. And I, I question all my life choices. <laughs> 
as to why I've never done it before. Never, I've never used that tactic before. In 25 years of playing Pokemon games, I've never done the defense core rollout tactic. And I don't know why, because I swept Whitney with a Geodude. I use defense curl. I use rollout from the TM that you get uh, in the route just above Goldenrod. Uh, if you take, if you go up and then you take a right before you go into the bug catching contest and you circle all the way around the TM for rollout is just up there. Defense curl rollout on the Clefairy takes two or three to kill the Clefairy. By the time you get to the mill tank, the fourth one just completely wipes it out. And I was like, what the fuck's happened here? This is insane. So many things could go wrong. An attract could come in. She could be faster and use a stomp and you flinch. You can mess. Rollout's only like 90% accurate. Like loads of things could go wrong. But I remember, I remember when I did that in gold, I was like, I just swept Whitney. This is the run. It wasn't the run. Um, but that's another thing that I know to avoid. I'm also like for the first time I think ever while playing a generation two game, I uh my, 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 my box filled up and it was I got a phone call from Bill saying Oh, hiya, you're uh, you can't catch any more Pokemon, mate, until you swap your box around. I was like, the fuck you on? I, I, literally, I had so, so I had so many Pokemon in backup, ready to go. And I just I just got swept. The, the stupid thing I did in gold there was you have to fight two of them back to back, but you don't have to fight the third one. And I went, oh, I'll just fight the third one since I'm here. And what I should have done was gone back to a Pokemon Center, got rid of the Pokemon that fainted, replaced them, trained them up, and then gone back and fought the last one. But I didn't because I was dumb. So, you know, a lot of silly mistakes, a lot of silly decisions being taken generally when I lose these Nuzlocks. Um, but yeah, Silver silver one, which I'm doing at the moment, uh, just, I think we've just cleared the Slowpoke well. Wait, have I beaten Bugsy? Where am I in Silver? I've, ju I've just beaten Bugsy. Uh, I reckon I probably just did a, a geoded a geoded sweep. I tell you what, geoded is a fucking necessary addition in generation two. I think not having a geoded would be would make this a night would absolute nightmare. Um, look, especially for a Nuzlocke, luckily there are three places you can get it. You can get it in, uh, I want to call it Route Two, but it's not Route Two. It's like Route Forty something. Um, so like a Geodude or Rattata or Jigglypuff usually, you can get it in the Dark Cave, it's either a Zubat or a Geodude, or you can get it in the other cave that's at the bottom end, down there, I don't know, there, you can get like a Geodude or a Sandshrew or an Onyx or a Zubat, or something, I like five Rattatas in there one day, um, yeah, lots of places for it, and you know, the fact that, I mean, Geodude's, if you're not if you're not playing to a to a level cap, get your Geodude up to level eleven. Sweep you sweep uh Faulkner's gym. You can sweep the bug gym as well. When you get the roller TM, you can sweep Whitney's gym. Uh, because it'll have magnitude, you can sweep Morty's gym. By the by this point, it's a graveler. I mean, if you're playing a level cap. It won't be a graveler for Morty unless you've got right to the twenty-five. Um, you leave it alone for Chuck. It is imperative in uh Jasmine's gym. It is bloody useful in Price's gym. Uh, Claire, nothing really works with Claire, but by that point, I mean if you've got something which which can learn Ice Punch, then you're golden. If not, then you know, good luck. But I mean by that, but is it not a, is it not like a powder snow TM or an ice beam TM in the ice cave? I can't remember. I mean by by that point again, if you're not Nuzlocke, I mean even if you are Nuzlocke and like whatever ice thing you get in the cave, generally just take that in and sweep the dragons and then you're golden. Um but yeah, like Geodude is is I'm I'm realizing is the MVP of Gen 2, especially the Jotel part of Gen 2. Um and as long as you've got a solid flying type to take on Chuck, love the jubbly. Uh, and then clear, like I said, you just need you need a strong ice type move somewhere, and then you're fine. Um, and then yeah, onto the elite four. It's good. It's good. I'm I'm thoroughly enjoying thoroughly enjoying Gen two. Gen two was my Pokemon Gold was my first ever Pokemon game. Uh, so I I've got a real soft spot for Generation two. Um, I thought I would when I when I first played Heart Gold. Uh, I thought that would end up being my favourite Pokemon game of all time because, you know, Gen 4 mechanics in a Gen 2 game, and it just felt bloated. I mean, this is just coming off the back of Platinum, and I think I had I had 
try to like a hundred percent complete all the things you can do in Platinum, like catch Heatran and Cresselia and re you know refight the Elite Four when they're you know ridiculously higher levels and all that stuff. And then I went to Heart Gold, and at that point I was like, I was ready to move on to the next generation of Pokemon. At that point, and I got stuck on Platinum and Heart Gold for about ten years. And with that, I think we're done. Uh, thank you so much for listening, everyone. I uh, hope you enjoyed my take on the on Eurovision this year and obviously you know, all the new Doctor Who details, which is great. <clears throat> uh, next week, God knows what I'll do. Uh, probably some kind of Doctor Who-related things. I haven't done a Doctor Who podcast in a while. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you've got any suggestions, you can hit me up at Gmail at the SGD Show podcast at gmail.com. Um, also on YouTube is the SGD Show podcast and TikTok at the SGD Show as well. Uh, yeah. yeah. As always, you know, whatever platform you listen to this on, like it, subscribe, comment, thumbs up, high five me, give me a big smile, whatever it is that's there. Uh, yeah, and I'll figure out something for next week. But until then, take care and I'll see you next time on the SGD Show.